So I have been working in the field of uh, protein design of protein-protein interactions actually for a long time, starting from my postdoc. And uh, I just continued in my lab designing proteins. I think it's a lot of fun. So if we look at protein-protein interactions in the cell, uh, there are the functions of protein-protein interactions are very, very diverse. And you need them everywhere. You need them for cell signaling, for DNA packing packaging for muscle contractions and many, many others. So what is interesting for us that um, binding affinities of protein-protein interactions, they span a very large range, or at least 10 orders of magnitude. So binding affinity of KDs, uh, you know, they, uh, they are related uh, obviously to delta, uh, delta G of binding. And indeed, they are very, very variable. On the other hand, if we look at structures of protein-protein complexes in the PDV, uh, we see that they look kind of similar. I mean, if you look at this structure, which uh, with affinity of 10 to the minus 13, very, very high affinity complex, and you look at this structure, um, from the first sight, you don't see here something very, very different. And this corresponds to the... Uh, ubiquitin uh, target complexes, which is very weak affinity, 10 to the minus 4 molar. Okay, so what is particular? What, how do they, if we look at structure, how can we tell if this is a high affinity complex or low affinity complex? So for, for a long time, it was actually considered that KD binding affinity is proportional to buried surface area, the surface that gets buried uh, in the, when the complex is formed. So there were many o old papers that showed graphs like this, where here you, th you have log of KD, and here you have a contact area. And apparently, uh, I mean, you can put a straight line through this. Apparently, there is direct correlation between the two, and it's a pretty good correlation. But think about it. These early papers, they have very, very few data points in, in their graphs. Um, so as, uh, as we started getting more and more structures of protein-protein complexes and measuring more and more affinities, it turns out that this is probably not true. So in our recent papers, the, we actually analyzed the database of 150 uh, different complexes with structures and measured affinities. And we saw that actually KD does not correlate strongly with, uh, with uh, delta A, so with buried surface area you see certain very weak correlation, but you see very, very big scatter um, on both sides. And actually, even this bet, uh, database, which has 150 complexes, it's still a small, pretty small database. Um, one of the things that I can point out that if you look at weak affinity complexes, they're just not in the PDB because they're very hard to crystallize, right? And uh, we can actually add some data points from our recent work with uh, our collaborators where you have very large interface between ubiquitin and, and different USPs. The surface area is very large and yet affinity is very weak. And you can add a number of points like this, basically. Uh, interestingly, uh, if you look at such protein-protein clo protein complexes, you can evolve them very easily to go from this weak affinity to high affinity. So what we think that um, what is determined um, uh, by bird surface area, it's the limit of KD where you can get through evolution. Okay, so the larger surface area could support high affinities in principle. But in nature, it's not always like this because KD is determined by function of this particular interaction. Okay, so when I started my lab and we started working on design of uh, binding, uh, of binding interfaces, protein-protein interactions, it turned out that um, energy functions for protein design that Sarel um, has uh, have discussed recently, those energy functions were heavily um, parameterized for design of monomeric proteins, for design of protein folding. And we learned that um, actually there are some differences between protein monomeric proteins and interfaces. So uh, if in monomeric proteins you have hydrophobic cores and hydrophilic surfaces, uh, 
So in binding interface, uh, you have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues. So electrostatic forces are not very important here for protein folding, but they become much more important for protein binding. Uh, protein cores are usually tightly packed in the interfaces. Actually, we might see some holes. So we have realized that we have to optimize our energy function for design of protein-protein interactions. And we did it by uh, just taking a regular, mm, regular uh, energy function that we had and just optimizing, taking all the terms that we had, the atomic-based uh, terms, and just um, optimize the weights in front of uh, all those terms um, on the problem of reproducing side-chain conformations in protein-protein interfaces. So we took a database of 100 complexes and we optimize this energy function by reproducing rotomers of amino acids in this region, in the region of binding interface. So what kind of questions can you, um, can you answer with designing computational design of protein-protein interactions, except for those that Sorel already uh, talked about? So one, uh, some of the questions that interest us is, can we modulate binding of specificity with computational methods? Can we enhance binding affinity? And what can we learn about protein interaction evolution from our designs? So I'll give you a few examples on every question. So uh, why is it important um, to learn to modulate binding specificity? So you know that uh, when you design a drug, um, okay, usually uh, it binds to your target molecule very well. And, but in, in human body, there are many proteins that could be very homologous to your target <coughs> protein, right? This is usually the case. So this drug would bind with similar affinity to your target and also to some other proteins in the body. And this is, of course, very undesirable. This causes um, side effects. So what we can do with computation, we can design a few mutations on this uh, drug candidate, and by this uh, means we can make it uh, bind tightly to this particular target, but destroy binding to other proteins. Okay, so um, first, in our first example, we actually <coughs> worked on protein, which is not related to medicine. Um, this was a proof of concept that we can do such things. So we took uh, a protein called modeling, which is small calcium binding protein, binds for calcium ions in uh, two in each globular domain. And what is interesting, in nature it binds and regulates hundreds of structurally and functionally different proteins. So how does it do <coughs> it? Okay, and how, how if we want to, to enhance binding specificity of calmodulin or any other protein, what do we do? In theory, what do we do? So um, being a biophysicist, this is uh, the uh, algorithm that we, we can propose. So you have uh, your protein bound to a desired target, and you would like to uh, use computational design to lower the energy of this state, of your protein bound to the desired target. At the same time, you have your protein also bind, uh, bound to many undesired targets, and the energy is about the same here and here. <coughs> and what you want to do is you, you want to raise the energy of those states, right? And then delta, delta G will, will be greater. So this is called, um, on the left, this is called positive design, and this is called negative design. So it turned out uh, in protein design that actually in some cases you can <coughs> neglect those states altogether, and nevertheless you will just by designing your protein to bind towards this target, you automatically design your protein not to bind to other targets. Um, in some examples, for example, in, in my work uh, on Calmodulin, we showed in many, actually in several examples, that we do not need this negative design to enhance binding specificity. Yet in some other systems, for example, in coil coils, in this work by Havranik and Harbury, and also in some later works by Bill de Grado, um, those uh, authors prove that here you need 
really you need to incorporate negative design in your algorithm. Otherwise, you do not enhance specificity. Okay, so how do we explain theoretically that uh, we do not need negative design? And this was my explanation in one of my earlier papers. So let's see that this is the fitness function for, for, the, for binding, right? And this is uh, the binding to the desired target. And you start your optimization, this is the wild type protein. And each step here represents one mutation. So when you optimize your protein to bind to, to certain target, you basically you make a few mutations and you kind of move around the maximum. You either increase the fitness or you keep it unchanged, okay? But um, if you consider the alternative targets that you don't even consider in your design, basically, then you introduce random mutations in respect to those targets. And because uh, there is a high probability of a random mutation to decrease fitness, so just because of this high probability, most of your mutational steps will lead down. And the thing here in this explanation, the more mutations you make, the more such steps you make, the higher probability that you go down this way, and then you enhance specificity. Okay, so uh, in the first work uh, on Cal modeling, we picked two different targets, uh, CAMK2 and calcineurin. So this target, CAMK2, is a kinase. It's a major synaptic enzyme and it's activated by calcium calmodulin. The second target is phosphatase. It's a major synaptic enzyme also, and it's also activated by calcium calmodulin. So differential affinity of this of calcium calmodulin for these two targets actually determines signaling output in the synapse. So it's interesting if we can ma manipulate this uh, specificity, we can actually change the output of uh, signaling. So what we did computationally, uh, we optimized Calmodulin just using the positive state in our calculation, and we completely neglected the negative state. And the goal was to create Calmodulin mutant with higher affinity to CAMK2 and low affinity to calcineurin. So what we actually did, we took a structure of Calmodulin bound to the calcineurin peptide, um, we computationally optimize all the residues in the binding interface of Calmodulin, shown here in green, and the rest of the residues were allowed to change conformations. Okay, another thing that we explored if, uh, so if you look at the energy function, at the scoring energy function, it has two components. One is intramolecular interactions. This is between Calmodulin and the peptide. The second component, it's intramolecular within Calmodulin itself. So what we did, um, we put different uh, factors in front of those two energy terms and we basically emphasized with uh, varying uh, parameters, we emphasized this term because we wanted to enhance binding. So we made, uh, uh, this is the results of computational design. Um, this is the, uh, all the residues in the wild type color modeling that we optimize. Uh, these are the predicted mutations here. And there are six different sequences that we got depending on those two coefficients alpha and beta. Then we went to experiments. We made six color modeling mutants um, that uh, range from five to nine mutations. Okay, so we measured binding experimentally to these two targets. And this was the result. This is binding of uh, Calmodulin mutants to CAMK2, the desired target. And what we saw that in five out of six examples, we got indeed enhanced affinity to these targets. One of the targets was actually showed decreased affinity. So not targets, uh, mutants. And then we measured binding to alternative target, consignurum. And here we saw the opposite effect all of the mutants <coughs> exhibited decrease in binding to this target. And actually, if you look at the scale, this is much higher than what is shown here. So the increase was actually even greater, even though we didn't even include it in the computation at all. And if you look at the binding specificity increase, uh, all of the mutants that we constructed um, showed increase in binding specificity, 
uh, by different amounts and actually one of them showed a very very substantial increase in binary specificity um, almost three orders of magnitude 900 fold with only nine mutations incorporated. This is a very substantial result achieved purely computationally and also not even incorporating negative design into our design procedure. So conclusions, we can increase binding specificity manifold with computational design. We can increase affinity to any call modeling target, but the increase that we saw was relatively modest. However, we can design mutations that significantly decrease affinity to al alternative targets. Okay, so now something a little bit different. Uh, before, we wanted to enhance binding specificity. Now, we want to make proteins multispecific. They're the other way around. <coughs> so some proteins um, in already in nature, they interact with many different targets. For example, as I told you, called modeling. So to design one protein to interact with many targets, uh, a number of algorithms uh, have been developed which is called multi-state design. So you optimize sequence of this protein when it's interacting with all those targets at the same time, right? So you basically sum up the energies. So in this work, uh, we know that nature already has many multi-specific proteins, for example, called modeling. So in this wo work, we actually tried to mimic protein evolution and to see how such proteins evolved, how the sequence of such proteins have evolved to be multi-specific. So we took 16 structures of call modeling interacting with different targets. These are all available structures at the time. And what we did, first of all, we defined the common binding interface, all the residues that are present in the 75% of the structures. Uh, and these were 12 different positions, and we designed them. Okay, so how did we did design? First of all, we took those 16 structures, and we designed our modeling sequence to be optimal for one target at a time. So this is called one-state design. Then we took pairs of different structures and designed call modeling uh, to interact, to be optimal for two targets at a time, then for three targets at a time, and then finally for 16, uh, 16 targets at a time. And then we got certain sequences for, for each of these design procedure. We got call modeling sequences and we compared them. So conclusion one that we saw the more states you consider in the design, the more similarity to wild type sequence you get. Maybe something trivial, but I think it, it's a beautiful conclusion. So this shows the number of predicted mutations out of 20 positions that we got. This is a distribution. So as you see, if you design call modeling to interact with one target, on average you get 9.5 mutation. If you design it to interact with two targets, you get seven mutations, three targets, six mutations, four tar uh, 16 uh, targets, you get four mutations. So this is almost, we almost recovered the wild type sequence, basically. Okay, the second conclusion that uh, we made is about the energies of our sequences. So it turns out, why do we, uh, why don't we need negative designs here? It's because the energies that we get uh, um, are very, if we design a target to, to be, opt design our modeling f to be optimal for one target, uh, the energies of interaction with the other target will be very, very high. So basically, uh, we first designed 100 sequences to interact with target B, and we compared uh, the energies of these 100 sequences on the structure of target A. And what we got, that a lot of such sequences gave very high energy, okay? They were um, actually very non-optimal. So this explains why the negative design is, was not needed at all. However, if you design um, <coughs> a modeling to interact with two targets, B and C, and, and evaluate their energies in structure A, this distribution shifts to the left. You get better energies. 
if you design Calmodian to interact with three different targets, it has even better energies <coughs> interacting with target A. Okay, so now move to the second topic of my talk, is can we enhance binding affinity of protein-protein interactions? Okay, so why do we need to enhance binding affinity? Again, there is a very interesting implication in drug design because what we can do, uh, if this is our target protein, we can take an eff a natural effector of this protein that already exists in the body. <coughs> now we design, let's say, four different mutations on this effector. We can increase affinity, let's say, hundredfold or thousandfold, and this effector will become an inhibitor of this target. So <laughs> it's not only that we have an inhibitor, a potential drug, these natural effectors would be very useful because they're already non-toxic, they're present in, in the body, they're non-toxic, they're non-immunogenic. Okay, so it's a very appealing strategy. So how do we do this? Uh, first of all, to do this, we needed a good protocol for calculating delta-delta G of binding for various mutations. And although this is something very simple, um, it still remains a difficult problem due to two things. First of all, inaccuracy of our energy functions. And the second is confirmational sampling, something that Saral was talking about. Uh, although <coughs> everything seems to so easy in his talk, but I'm sure that it's not like that, actually. And his students can probably tell me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we developed this easy prot uh, protocol. You have, first of all, you take the structure of the complex. You calculate its energy, but just by, by looking at the residues at uh, near the site of the mutation, okay? Not all the residues, just very, very near the mutation. Then you separate the two chains. You calculate energies on its own. You subtract those two. Then you do the same thing for the wild type and for the mutant. You subtract the wild type from the mutant. You get your delta, delta G of binding. So basically you do there is a movie that uh, shows you what we do. Now we can actually, instead of just doing one mutation, we can uh, do saturated mutagenesis in silico. We insert here all possible amino acids. We repack the surrounding residues and calculate delta delta G of binding. And as you can see from this movie, this is really the movements are very, very minimal. Here we don't allow backbone movements at all. We actually have a protocol to also incorporate the backbone movements. But this protocol is the simplest version. It's also very, very fast. This is what, what is attractive. Okay, so we now we tested this protocol on different proteins experimentally. So actually, the first system we picked was actually a crazy system to pick because not only it's a very, very high affinity com uh, complex, but also the proteins were very difficult to work with. But nevertheless, we succeeded, so uh, <laughs> it's great. So actually, the, the complex I'm talking about, it has to do with acetylcholinesterase that Sorel has already introduced to you. And this protein is a, a toxin that comes from green mamba snake. And actually, um, when snakes bite, uh, this, this toxin, it binds to acetylcholinesterase and that results into paralysis and um, basically uh, death of small uh, rodents, right? So it also binds to the human enzyme, al although with slightly uh, worse uh, affinity. Okay. So yeah, I told you. So this is a toxin, it's a small protein. Um, belongs to three finger toxin <coughs> family, 61 amino acids, four disulfide bonds, and it's extremely stable to high temperatures and proteases. And this is the protein, so the toxin binds here, the active site is somewhere in the middle. So three structures have been sold for this protein-protein uh, complex, where acetylcholinesterase comes from in the mouse, torpedo, californica, or human. And you can see structures are very homologous. This is the toxin, of course. So the affinities that were measured for this toxin binding to, to these two species was very high, 90 picomole and 300 picomole here. 
Okay, so our goal was can we improve affinity of such a high affinity complex even further through computational methods? So what we did, we performed computational saturated methogenesis on the fascicoline binding interface, and the results are shown here. So here are all the residues at the interface, and here are substitutions to all amino acids. And the scale is like this. So if you see a red dot here, that means the mutation is very destabilizing. If you see a blue dot, the mutation is very is stabilizing, and green is something in the middle. It's around zero. So what can you see here? We, we scanned this interface for torpedo enzyme and for the human one. So the first thing that comes uh, into mind that those maps are really red. That means that most mutations would be destabilizing. And only a few mutations that we see here are blue and those that we predict to improve affinity. So what we did next, <coughs> we again, we did experiments. We picked a number of different fascicular mutants. We constructed them and we measured binding affinity. So this graph actually shows a master's thesis of one of my students who did all those points because every point uh, to make this mutants uh, actually a very laborious task. It took him a long time and then to measure all of them. <coughs> but we got a very nice result at the end. So this graph shows uh, experimental binding affinity versus the calculated binding affinity. And as you can see, uh, the correlation is quite good. We get a correlation of 0.7, which is not perfect, but for this field, it's actually a quite a good correlation. Uh, our model, again, is very simple. We only use side chain flexibility. We don't even model backbone flexibility. So interestingly, we found uh, four or five mutations that did increase binding affinity further. So it is possible to enhance this affinity into single picomolar uh, KD range. And this, uh, this is correlation graph, which we use the different published method, CC, PBCA, which actually use backbone flexibility uh, versus our experimental results, and we got much worse correlation with, the, with our results. Okay, so next example, uh, I will talk about a different protein-protein complex. Uh, this is a medium affinity complex between matrix metalloproteinase and its inhibitor TIMP. So this is another multi-specific interaction. You have 24 MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases, which actually enzymes that uh, uh, really, uh, they're also therapeutical targets. They're linked to cancers and many other diseases. So many companies are working on designing drugs for, this, for these proteins. And in nature, there are uh, four natural different inhibitors of these proteins. They're called TIMPs, one to four. And each of the TIMP, <coughs> they bind to all uh, 24 members of the MMP family with similar affinities. So what we did, we took one of those teams, team two, and we took two enzymes. And again, we would like to convert this protein into something more specific and something that binds with high affinity to the enzyme. So we did the computational saturated metagenesis again uh, for this target enzyme, MMP14, and another one, MMP9. And as you can see here, the maps are very different. The colored very different from the previous example. Here, they're mostly green and a lot of blue dots and actually very <coughs> few red dots. And what does it mean? It means that these interfaces are not optimized. There are many possibilities to improve affinity. And indeed, this is what we saw experimentally. Um, here, you see binding of, our, of uh, 13 different mutants to MMP14. And basically, out of 13, we got 10 with improved affinity to MMP14. This is a very high success rate for computational protein design, as Sorrel can point out. Um, and this is because these interfaces are so non-optimal, in a way, it's very easy to make them better. Okay, now we measured binding to the second enzyme, MMP9. And here, what you can see that certain mutations they increase affinity to both enzymes. So they increase affinity, but no specificity. But certain mutations like this one certainly showed increase in binding specificity. 
So actually, we've got 11 point mutations that with improvement in binding specificity. However, the improvement was relatively modest, not exceeding a factor of 10 for a single mutation. So what we did next, um, we decided to design a combinatorial library and to combine a few of those good mutations together. Okay, and why didn't we do it with computation? Because uh, the probability of getting, let's say, one mutation that will be deleterious was quite large. So it was easy to do it through combinatorial technique. So uh, when we design combinatorial libraries, we look at positions where, uh, let's say here, we had a lot of choices with blue dots, which are improving affinity. And on the other hand here, we had a lot of destabilizing mutations. So we knew those positions are important for specificity. <coughs> we can go even further. What we can do, we can limit our libraries to some um, amino acid choices. For example, we can pick those three here, uh, where blue here, but they're yellow and green here, right? So, and this is, of course, if we can encode them together by one degenerate codon. So we did this in collaboration uh, with Nif Papu, my student Jason Shirian in uh, Nif Papu at Ben Gurion University. We used yeast display now to select TIMP mutants out of these combinatorial libraries to bind with high affinity to MMP14. And actually our preliminary results are very, very uh, promising. What we see is we can select a mutant that um, with Enhancement and binding affinity to the desired targets uh, with minus 3.5 kilocalories per mole. This is very substantial. There's al also some increase uh, in binding to unwanted targets. However, this increase is very small in comparison to this one. And we actually can discriminate those targets by at least a factor of 10 in terms, uh, not 10, sorry, 100 in terms of binding affinity. Desired versus uh, undesired targets. Okay. So in the last few minutes, I'll talk about what can we learn about uh, protein evolution from our computational results. Okay. So I told you that we can produce those maps, computational saturated metagenesis maps for different binding interfaces. So what can we learn from those maps about protein evolution? And one thing that we can predict uh, certainly, these are binding hotspots. These are residues here, positions here, where no matter what you mutate them to, everything is red. All the mutations are destabilizing. And this is called binding hotspot. And this has, binding hotspots have been already intensively studied. This is maybe not so interesting for us. But we can do something else, uh, more interesting. We can also predict positions which we call binding cold spots. And those are positions that have a lot of blue mutations here. So potentially, they're very interesting for protein engineering. Here is where you can improve affinity. So for example, if you want to do affinity maturation, you should limit your library to these two positions. And with high probability, you get, good, uh, you get affinity improvement. So what are protein call spots? Those are positions in protein-protein interfaces that are occupied by non-optimal amino acids. Uh, we define them that at least three mutations lead to affinity improvement at these positions. And uh, they are very important to both protein evolution and to protein design. So here are some examples from literature. This is not our work, but we define this as a protein call spot. For example, this is taken from a paper by Ron Diskin and Pamela Bjorkman where what they did here, um, there was an antibody that binds and inhibits um, to the uh, GP1, uh, GP120 protein of HIV virus. And while this, this was an antibody, they wanted to improve this antibody. And they looked at the structure. And just by looking at the structure, they saw that there is a glycine here in this loop. And there is a huge hole uh, close to this glycine. Okay? There is nothing inside there. So what they did, they, they mutated the glycine to tryptophan. And indeed, they saw that this uh, increase in contact with, with, this, with the protein and also 
what it results to into improving breadth and potency of this antibody by an order of magnitude. So this is a classical cold spot, what we call it, because you have here a hole which you can actually fill with many different choices, not only tryptophan, you can put here different hydrophobic amino acids, and all of them will improve affinity, basically. So this is an example, structural example of a cold spot we saw in our complex. This is fascicle and acetyl-CoA interaction. Remember, this is very high affinity interaction. And so what we saw here, there was this histidine on position 29. It's not interacting with anything on the second protein. There is no intermolecular contact. Now, if we can mutate it to, let's say, uh, an arginine, we can create a hydrogen bond and a salt bridge to uh, aspartate, uh, which is located on the enzyme, and this improved binding affinity by a factor of 10 in our case. Uh, and I forgot to mention, this is located on the very periphery of the binding interface, right? So, and remember that this is high affinity interaction. Another example from our recent study, which is not yet published, uh, this is ubiquitin interacting with USP. And this is an example of another cold spot in this complex. Remember, this is very low affinity interaction on the other, on the other hand. So here we have a lysine uh, on ubiquitin lysine 6, which basically interacts with uh, hydrophobic amino acids on the enzyme. It's charged residue, which is found in hydrophobic environment. This is very energetically unfavorable. Now we can mutate this lysine to many different choices. And by this, uh, in this way, we can increase affinity by 350 fold by one mutation, which is you know, a great number. Uh, there are actually two choices that we saw. One is mutating this uh, lysine to asparagine and creating a, a new hydrogen bond, also removing charge. Uh, another way you can mutate it to, to a methionine, which is similar in shape to lysine, but it's hydrophobic. And you have a very similar effect. So our current and future work is we would like to map and to see more cold spots in various protein-protein interactions and to analyze where they're located and how we can modify them to improve binding affinity. So we postulate that in high affinity PPIs, cold spots are relatively rare and they are located at the periphery of binding interface. So there is nothing that you can prove improve in the middle, but in the periphery you can actually improve. If you look at low affinity PPIs on the contrary, we think that cold spots are not only frequent, but also they are located everywhere and something, sometimes they are even buried within the core of the binding interface. Okay, and this I would like to thank. Uh, mostly this talk was done by, by past members of my lab, Osha Rabi, Jonathan Eisner, Eli Yosef, Menachem Frommer, uh, Jason Shirian. And I had many col collaborations. I have a very good collaboration with Nif Papo from Ben Gurion, with Dead Seed Who at Toronto, with many people at Weizmann and Ru uh, Christian Herman at Ruhr University. So thanks, and I'll take questions. Um, I have one question. Can you measure? become on affinities, uh, it's gets on and never gets off? So we, those uh, experiments were done actually through enzyme activity assays. And in those systems, you can measure PCOMOL affinities because you need very low concentrations of, of proteins for these experiments. <coughs> have a homodimer instead of two different protein, can you still uh, use this protein design to increase the affinity? If I have a homodimer? Homodimer, yeah. Well, then you have to design symmetrical mutations, right? You have to introduce the symmetry, but yeah. Yes. So, One of the problems of <coughs> the initial design of pandas is that uh, one usually achieves relatively low affinity. So did you <coughs> try to take such a initial designs uh, without uh, evolutionary uh, 
pressure then to do selection, but just to take the basic design and then do an optimization using your method to see whether you actually could increase affinity uh, computationally. We haven't tried it, but maybe it's a good, a good problem to test it on. Um, so based on all the work you've done so far, would you, you, you've shown cases where there are really good examples of no need for negative design. Would you say before working on a system, it's preferable to mm -hmm. uh, do some sequence alignment, structural alignment to understand how many similar targets you have? Because you might think a random mutation uh, will uh, in decrease affinity to other binders, but if you have targets binding in the same manner, then you'll increase binding to several parts of the So I think like in coil coil systems, for example, we know that you, you need negative design because there are many different conformations of these coils that you have in principle to consider, right? That's not only dimers, trimers, tetramers, and so on, different orientation. So you have, if you have, you know, protein of somewhat complex shape, it's somewhat, uh, uh, I think, more success. We are more successful in uh, not using negative design. The other thing that I want to point out that again, it depends on the number of mutations that you introduce, because uh, in case where you introduce only one or two mutations, it's very hard to destroy binding to alternative targets. Right? This is what we showed. But if you introduce enough mutations. You know, uh, by chance, uh, you probably will succeed in optimizing uh, against the unwanted targets. Okay, thank you. Did you try to optimize the um, acetyl cone restorase mutations to species which are susceptible to fasciculin envenoming? In other words, there are certain species which are more susceptible to fasciculin right. than human. So you could correlate the mutations that you found to those found in nature. So those found in nature, but fasciculin is not fasciculin. Uh, that's still uh, I'm not sure what you what you mean. We only designed the fasciculin. Are the you not? You not we did not design acetylcholine esters. More questions? Okay. Yeah, thanks.